I've been a photographer as long as I can remember. My mom handed me a 35mm film camera back when I was a kid and I pretty much never looked back. I'm most known for my portraiture. Whether it's traveling the world and finding the right environment, or building a set to complement whoever I'm taking a photo of, I've always been working around a human subject. I've worked with athletes, celebrities, musicians. I've shot for more brands than I can remember. But when it came to underwater photography, it's something I fell into a little bit by accident. I've always been a little obsessed with the water. It started out shooting for surfboard companies, wetsuit brands, things like that. And it progressed into taking pictures in swimming pools, using bathtubs, anywhere I could control an environment but incorporate water. I loved the challenge of taking away visibility, the ability to speak to your subject, and messing with gravity. It was an excitement that made me rethink how I've been taking pictures for most of my working life. But the underwater shoot I'm most known for kind of happened at a weird timing. And all of this started off as like a joke that Steve had with like his friends over COVID about like, oh, we won't have to worry about like, you know, getting together if we all have our own air. I was just being funny because at the time there was a bunch of contradicting rules about photography and filmmaking and where you could and where you couldn't. And uh, anyway, so it like blew up into, into this fun photo shoot that we did, which we didn't expect would, you know, um, get as much like attention and hype as it did. That led to an accidental Guinness World Record. The shoot ended up becoming a pretty unintentional Guinness World Record. And it kind of like uh, fueled, you know, like a fueled the fire. Like we're like, okay, we have this record, um, 21 uh, foot depth record. We were beyond excited to accept it. But the funny thing was the shoot was not depth based. It was completely built around the cool location and not how deep it was. But it made news and the news kept spreading. First it was Petapixel and Demilked and it was all over online. Then it was the National Post and newspapers across North America. Then it was published in the biggest dive magazine in the world. Suddenly friends were texting me that it was in magazines in Poland or published in Russia or Brazil, even Italy. For me it was the first time in my life that I had been published for something I did just out of creativity and not with a motive of working with brands or public figures. And we're like, that's, uh, we could do better. We could do better. And it just kind of like lit the fire. And, you know, we were both on the same page. We're like, how do we do this? Where this is like gonna be, um, you know, really exciting, but, you know, still safe. Over the next couple of years, doing the dive back in Tobermory crossed my mind every time I had a free minute. I was lucky enough that in my travels I was able to meet up with Sierra a few times and we practiced underwater for fun. Then this past summer I was hired by Fujifilm to be their underwater DOP. I was heading to Miami to do some work on a project for them and I called Marisha to fly down and help. It was so nice to work together as a team and at the end of the project, Fujifilm asked what we were up to and we explained that we were planning on going back to Tobermory one day to do another photo shoot. We wanted to continue the series. Fujifilm asked us the details and how deep we would go the next time. <laughs> you know, like it just, we picked a number, 100 feet, you know, 30 meters, 100 feet, can we do it? The response we got from the Fuji team was amazing and we knew right then that we had to do it again sooner than later. 
We had our eyes set on a shipwreck that's at exactly 100 feet. Um, I mean, I thought it was awesome. I was like, I love the idea of people are getting hyped up about, you know, scuba diving and like underwater anything. Like I love the water. And then when I realized that like, oh, there's a lot of press coverage and like, are we gonna be successful? Obviously there are some nerves. You feel a little bit of pressure, but ultimately, you know, the most important thing for Steve, and he has said it from day one, and the most important thing for me, and the most important thing for like all the safety divers, everybody was all about safety. It's like, we're gonna give it a go, but you know, there we're not pushing anything outside of the boundaries, you know, that we set forth. Now I've used a lot of underwater housings, but I'm always drawn to Aquatech. They're not the deepest cameras, but ergonomically they work so good. They can take a beating. I got my first one to shoot for surfers and I've been beating it up ever since. They're only rated to about 10 meters. But when we beat the record the last time, we were way beyond that. And I'd even taken their housings as deep as 75 feet. So I got on a call with them and told them what I wanted to do. Uh, it was exciting, you know, someone who was going to potentially push the limits of our equipment, but also someone who had had a great experience with the gear in the past and was looking to expand on that. Uh, we're always open to new ideas, especially when they've got such a creative twist like Steve's project. Aquatech was initially surprised at the depth I'd already taken the cameras to, and I told them Fujifilm was working with us again and that we wanted to go to 100 feet. They were pretty skeptical, but they were down to help us out anyway. Even after all that, we decided to be a part of this project, basically just to test the equipment at that kind of depth. Uh, we have quite limited depth testing when it comes to being in a depth and actually operating it. We can put it in a tank and we can simulate those conditions, but that's totally different to being at that depth and using the equipment and making sure things actually function in that way. So for us, it was like a win-win. You know, If Steve has a good result, we have a good result. I told them if we couldn't bring their camera to 100 feet, I would still be shooting in a number of shallower locations that it would be perfect for. The risk really wasn't on us for this. We put the kind of risk all on Steve. We're like, if you want to go for it, and you'll get access to the cameras, go for it. Uh, we'll be here. But we, you know, we had a low risk investment in this project. The other thing to consider at depth is that you start to lose color the deeper you go. In the shallow water, you lose your yellows, and as you go deeper, you lose your oranges. Your reds turn to black, and as you go deeper, it becomes just blue and gray and black. But if you bring light down, you can bring back some of those colors. In the real world, I love using strobes. I set up lights everywhere. I think of all the details. I'll hide them in lamps, behind curtains, wherever I can to help build my story. But underwater is a little different. Radio signal doesn't travel underwater, which means strobes need to be powered by wires. And to avoid having wires all over, and one more thing to worry about underwater, I tend to use video lights for my photography. I was prepared to mount a couple lights on my camera and just make it work again, and then I got a call from Nan Light. I would say Nan Light was interested in his projects because of his unique shooting style. The fact that he does so much and is very interesting in his look underwater. Um, that really kind of drew us in and made us want to be a part of it. Typically, the tubes themselves uh, were rated for about 32 feet or 10 meters, um, but we've had people use it around 60 feet. Nanlite was super eager, so they were excited to see what I could do at 100 and if it would survive. Well, since we had seen them use beyond the, the 10 meters setup before, we were kind of curious to see, okay, how far do we think we could push these lights? And that was one of the ways that we said, you know what, Steve, here, take it and see what you can do with it.
September is the end of the summer. And so we figured in terms of temperature, this was our best bet because the waters had the whole entire summer to warm up. And so this was our best bet to, you know, to have conditions that were um, achievable. And so here we are. We did a lot of stuff in preparation. Uh, Steve spent a lot of time training. He earned his advanced open water certification. He earned his nitrox certification. Um, we were working on, you know, compass work. So he was doing like search and recovery. Like Steve just like fully dedicated himself to this and just, you know, whatever had to be done, he wanted to be ready. We're pushing ourselves to be more creative, to challenge ourselves more. And, you know, these are one of those rare days that make me really proud and excited to be an artist. Man, this is what I mean. It's like, you know, it's like reuniting the dream team. I have missed Sierra so much. She has been all over the world modeling. And, and you know, in this industry, there are so many different faces that are rotating all the time. It really feels homely when you get to, to meet with recurring faces that you genuinely love so much. And man, the, the three people, the core of the group, we're all traveling around the world constantly. So to be in the same place at the same time with the same creative mindset is um, very well planned. <laughs> it took a month of being able to, to set a date and properly plan this. And I'm so glad that we did. The opportunity to actually be together like in the same place that we were before doing the same stuff. And like, it was such a pleasure to like be back together. Steve and I got really lucky that we had a couple of opportunities over the last two years to hang out and do a couple of other projects uh, together. Um, it was really nice to come up here and, uh, and do something for fun with my friends. We're shooting at a bunch of places this week but I think I'm most excited to bring Sierra back to the Wetmore. That's where we beat the record to begin with. She's had two more years to practice underwater, and it's gonna be really nostalgic for us to work together on that same wreck. For the deep dive, I'm a little bit worried to bring Sierra down to 100 feet. It's not that I don't think she can handle it. She's trooped out way more than I could have ever imagined, but at that depth and that cold of a temperature, it's something that Marisha and I did not feel safe risking. So with that said, we elected Marisha, who's normally the safety, to take the modeling role on that wreck. It's the day before the big shoot and the practice dive we're going to about 45 or 50 feet. Basically, this is, <laughs> this is the culmination of like two years of talking and planning and, and all of that. We finally got the opportunity um, yesterday to uh, get in the water and have like a dry run. This is to figure out if the lighting is going to float or sink at that depth, to see if we need to add weight to anything, to test out the new camera housings, but also to do a dry run of getting Marisha down to depth and managing a long dress, taking off her BCD and making sure everybody can do their planned role. The idea was that there's like a lot of moving parts in this dive, like we needed to set up lights. We had, you know, Steve had to go down with multiple cameras. Like I had a very huge long gown that needed like somebody to like help me manage it. Um, you know, so it was kind of, it was a much bigger deal this time around uh, than the first time we did it. It was really cool to see everybody down at that location. And as I looked up from adjusting the lights, I saw Marisha taking off her BCD, Mindy taking it off of her hand, Mario giving her the air, and Michael unrolling the dress all at once. Everything just went smoothly. The camera housing um, could withstand the pressure. The lighting, uh, the housing for the lighting withstood the pressure. We came up with like a really quick and efficient way to like, you know, pull the gown out and then draw it back in. Um, I had really good communication with my safety diver. Uh, Steve had really good communication with his safety. Just everything just, you know, logistically worked. We got out of the water and started talking and recapping the entire situation. The dive helped us to define what we could do and it reassured that our plan would work at the deep dive. But there was one problem. 
<laughs> Marisha is not a model. Marisha feeling uncomfortable posing underwater and me not being able to art direct her or speak to her at depth meant we had to think of a backup plan. I'm, I'm always humbled when I meet people who are posing for the first time. Poor Marisha was so nervous on what to do with her hands and I'm sitting there freaking out over the depth. <laughs> we had completely different priorities. It was so easy, you know, to give Sierra, like, take the reins, like, I'm not gonna, just take the reins and tell me what to do, position me, like, tell me everything, you know, and I felt like almost like a sense of relief, like, this is off my shoulders, and it felt really good, and I trust her, like, the, the you know, it was really nice um, because of the trust that we built together on the previous uh, shoot, so it was really nice to work together and kind of, like, swap roles, right? Marisha, Sierra, and myself are heading off to the Wetmore now to do a photo shoot again at the original location we were at for the first Blue Old Record. Marisha's there as a safety diver, but also to watch Sierra and see how she's posing. She's watching how Sierra moves underwater, and we're going to recap with the team again so Marisha can practice further for the deep shoot. Um, I was a little bit concerned because all weekend, um, every single time I dove on the Niagara on scuba, uh, the thermocline was actually pretty high up on the descent line, which meant that that means it's more time I have to spend in very cold water. And so it was a little bit, you know, nerve wracking to be like, oh, the thermocline is really high, but also, uh, the temperature has been consistent all week and then it's been about seven degrees Celsius below the thermocline, which is kind of like at my limit. Like that's <laughs> my limit. I haven't really spent a significant amount of time with no exposure protection in uh, temperatures lower than that. So from a modeling perspective, the cold automatically freezes your body. It's just impulsive that your body locks up and just tries to protect all of its heat, but you have to make it look natural and flowing and and beautiful and graceful so you have to override all of your body's natural reactions and of course you still have them but you just don't show the camera and on top of that being being able to hide them and also being self-aware on a personal safety level is a very very difficult line to hold and um, the challenge is really exciting and luckily with such a big safety diving team you can experiment and explore in this area without fear of there being a problem. Everyone's got your back. The camp we're at for this trip is really cool. It's a former military base turned into a divers only cottage that at one point was used as the base for divers who were originally documenting and discovering the shipwrecks in this area. And if being in that environment and planning in that area is not cool enough, right before we crashed for the night, the Northern Lights came out. It's early. We're heading out to load the boat soon. 
The plan is we'll load up and head straight for the wreck. Marisha and I planned this weeks prior, and with Mario and his team there, we really could fine tune how we're gonna go about doing the deep shoot. So last time um, I was Sierra's um, safety diver, and then we had uh, Riley who was basically uh, uh, buddying up with Steve and being his support. And then this time around, just because we had so many things, like we had to manage dress, we had to manage temperature, we had to manage depth, we had uh, lights, we had multiple cameras, we had a lot of stuff going on. So my personal safety diver was Mario. Um, so he was dedicated to me in the way that I used to be dedicated to Sierra. Uh, then I had Miranda, who was dedicated to Steve and to be there to support him. Then we had Michael, who was there to help set up the lights. He was there to help manage the train of my dress uh, and overall lo logistics. At the boat, I had Sierra to talk me through right to the very last minute, just before I got in the water, to like make sure that it was all locked in. And of course, we have Anthony, who, if you know, if he wasn't there, there would be no behind the scenes. <laughs> so we had a much bigger team this time around. And of course, Captain Brian with us for the second time. Wow, love that guy. <laughs> The descent to this location is long, and it goes through a thermocline. That means a sudden significant drop in temperature along the line. What that means is as we descend in 16 or 17 degree water, it's going to at one point have a sudden drop in temperature to as low as 7 degrees. This drop in temperature usually means that there's some better visibility once it's cold, but the downside is that once Marisha passes through the thermocline, it becomes extremely dangerous for her. She does not have exposure protection, and at that depth in temperature, it can be extremely risky for her. They drop down, they place the lights or they want it on the rack. And then the two of them came up and collected me um, at the surface. So then uh, Michael and Miranda and Steve went ahead and began their dive. And I was about, you know, a few seconds after them. Uh, basically the idea was to allow Steve to get into position um, and the other safety divers to get into position so that when I got down, um, you know, it would just be a matter of me landing removing my BCD, unravel the dress, remove my mask uh, and hood, hand it to my safety diver, do a breathe up, hand off my regulator, and then I would pose. And so everything, you know, went according to plan. Everything went so smoothly. You know, all of the things that we tried to take into account, all the contingency plans, everything went really well.
But one of the things that happened was once I got below the thermocline, even though it was lower and it was a little bit warmer, uh, I just found that my diaphragm started spasming, which made it uh, nearly impossible to, you know, do proper breathe up. And then when I didn't have the regulator in my mouth, the diaphragm was spasming and I was worried that I was gonna start breathing water in through my nose. So I gave the signal to my safety diver to give me his regulator. I could not get the spasm to stop. And so I thought, well, maybe if we go up above the thermocline, the spasm will stop and we'll get one more shot down below. Uh, we attempted to go up above the thermocline. However, my gown started impeding our ability to swim up, which we kind of knew was gonna happen. We never intended to start moving up with the gown, uh, you know, still out and flowing. But I just thought if we can make it out of the thermocline so I could catch my breath and then I could drop down and give it one more go. After, you know, making an attempt to do that, we realized this probably <laughs> it's gonna work. And so at that point we collected the dress, um, you know, I held on to it. Uh, the safety diver told me, all right, that's it, we're going up. I said, all right, we're going up. And so uh, we made our way slowly up the ascent line, uh, did our safety stop, and then we safely exited the water. It was really fun to be able to break down poses in a way with someone who was not a professional in that way. And then seeing it all played out into these gorgeous, beautiful images, she really nailed it. She, she got the dancer hands. It was, it was great. We were all pretty surprised when we found out that Steve had taken the equipment down to such a great depth of 100 feet. Um, obviously, the equipment isn't really designed to go to that depth. Uh, it's not saying that you couldn't, but it's quite the risk that you have to take. Um, it, obviously, if the equipment fails and water gets in, you lose not only the camera, but potentially those images that you've captured at that depth. We are beyond ecstatic that you were able to use these lights at 100 feet or so for 45 minutes or longer. They stayed on, they did the work that they needed to do for you so you could get your shots. That to us is phenomenal. And we were so happy that we were able to do this. We were a little bit nervous that the equipment might fail at those depths, obviously without that previous testing. But Steve was so confident that we thought, well, you know, this is our shot to really test it. And he seems like it's, it's always gonna work. It was never gonna fail in his mind. So when he was able to pull that off and work at those depths, you know, we found a new level of testing that is no doubt gonna help the business in the future. We were worried that they might pop or implode at 100 feet um, because we knew the ratings, you know, being basically 60 feet had been the most we had pushed it. So to say that we were nervous is an understatement. And we were very surprised that it got all the way down to 100 feet and they worked as well as they did. Um, not that the quality of the equipment is not good, but, you know, environmental factors tend to change things. I felt everything went really, really well and I'm really proud of, uh, of what Steve managed to capture. The final shots to us were absolutely breathtaking. I, I, we always like the way Steve kind of goes at looking at certain things and we thought that that was just phenomenal. I think the images Steve was able to capture are amazing. You know, anything working at those depths, there's so many variables, whether it's light or the clarity, or just, you know, the whole logistical nightmare of trying to get a crew down there and air and everything like that. So the images are such a testament to Steve's effort and dedication to try to pull this off. I think it's a great success. I am like, yeah, we broke the record. I mean, we did it. We like, we went down to 30 meters, 100 feet, in a gown with lights, with a camera crew and everything. And we shot this photo, which is just so creepy to me. We did it. It was freaking cold. I, you know, some of the people were saying it was just as cold as it was last year. It was not, it was much more colder. And I was wearing a seven millimeter um, wetsuit. And, and it just kind of hit me in the face, just what she had done, how cold it was to look graceful and, I mean, you know, it was fun to try whether we did it or we didn't, but we did it, you know, and all the planning 
and all the preparation and everything paid off. And oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But there was one thing left I wanted to do before we put an official end to the trip. Take Sierra back to the first place we ever attempted an open water photo shoot. <laughs>